Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Okay, so you've got me again. Everybody else, everybody else has been busy, so I'm the, it's the least I can do. They're all doing some wonderful stuff. Um, and um, just contemplating what I wanted to share tonight, I felt that I, I kind of wanted to um, bring some conclusion to the three messages that we've talked about in one context. Also, there's some other thoughts within that that Bruce was talking to me about last week that um, in another context I want to share, but in the context of this, this environment and those that we're speaking to, you know, beyond and outside, um, I want to have one more pop at straight lines in a crooked world. Yeah. And I want to talk to you tonight about moving from theory to practice. I think one of the, um, one of the great dangers of uh, Christian faith and belief, and I suppose it can affect any other arena, is that you can get so locked into what is the doctrinal dogma of that thing that, it, that being the, the measure to which you can be dogmatic about the doctrine becomes the peak of the quest. Uh, and somewhere in there, who Jesus really is and who Jesus really was and what Jesus spent most of his time talking about gets lost. And uh, you could assume from some ways that the gospel is handled that um, all Jesus ever said, which incidentally he didn't, he didn't say this specifically at all anyway, but you'd think all Jesus ever said was, you're all a bunch of sinners... Um, you're all going to go and spend eternity in hell and you need to repent so that God can forgive you through what I'm going to do on the cross. Now, each of those elements has some truth in it, I think. Maybe some of them I don't agree with as much now. But actually, that was not Jesus' message. The, the message of Jesus was, was not... If you're familiar with this term, the gospel of salvation, it was actually the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus talked about something bigger in which we participate and which invades our lives than this narrow perspective of it's just about a fire escape to heaven. And, and, and I, I have some views about hell and heaven now, which, which I never questioned at one time, but I do very much question now. I'm happy to discuss that, converse that at any time, but I, I, the, the point of the gospel never was about heaven and hell in the context that you and I have had that picture painted. It was always about what Jesus said, look, if you want to understand this, here's what you've got to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth like it is in heaven. That says that there are two kingdoms coexisting side by side, not one that will finish here and another one will start, but that the kingdom of heaven is already active and functional and Jesus wanted us, while being in the earth, to live in the wonder of the kingdom of heaven. And uh, in different words, that's what we've been talking about. But my, my, my subtitle tonight is based in that because when we get locked into arguing over those kind of issues about is it just a fire escape from hell and what is hell and, you know, come to Jesus, go to heaven... Um, we tend to get stuck in theories about what we think the gospel is rather than actually living the gospel. The gospel is meant to be lived. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. He didn't even come saying, I've come that you might understand what the Bible says. He said, I've come that you might have life and have it in all its fullness. So I am becoming increasingly concerned for my own life first and therefore also because of the charge I have caring for you, that we ensure that, that we, we have more expression of practice than we do of theory, or at least an equal expression, 
because it's quite fascinating the things that Jesus focused in on very often are not the focus of the gospel as we live it and that will become clear as we go along. So let's just have a, a quick look at the, at the, at the final um, evolution of the wheel that we created so I can just step into this a little further. Of course we produced this last week as you can see and uh, I call that outer rim of the circle, if you call that time, okay, it's time. And, and parallel with that is eternity, the kingdom of heaven, but this is time. We live within time, and if you think of our lives being like those dots that are moving within the context of time, of course, what we've been talking about through this, this whole series of little messages is that it appears that the dots are going round in a circle, so you have a circle within a circle, when the reality is, when you focus on any one dot, you realize that the movement is created not by dots going round in a circle, but by those dots going from one end of the, of the outer circle to the other end in straight lines, okay? And, uh, and that as they move in straight lines, it creates a momentum within the wheel. It creates a wheel within the wheel. There is a movement and a motion. But when we began to name those, those spokes, like the, 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 the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control, patience, goodness, faithfulness, and you realize that as our life flows on those lines... That, that they affect the movement which is our life, and the movement that is our life uh, has purpose with it. Now, of course, what we did put in last week was that in the context of building a wheel and spokes, spokes don't work unless there is a hub. In fact, spokes in a wheel that has no hub will distort and bend, and they don't have any strength to keep the wheel together, the process of time, to keep the life together. They buckle and distort. Now, here's my point. Life without a hub means that even if you have in place love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, they will distort into something that is not the real deal because there is no hub to stop the spokes from distorting. So without a hub, you get tainted love. You get perverse joy and all the things that go along. So every one of us in life, forget the church, forget Christianity. How many of you know that everybody in life deep down is looking for love, joy, peace, goodness, faithfulness, kindness, gentleness, and hoping that within that they can have some patience and self-control, but everybody's looking for that. The issue is, in order for those to be straight lines in a crooked world, you have to have a hub. And I believe with all my heart that the hub is Christ. That by him and in him and through him, the Bible says, all things flow. And so when he becomes the hub, which is really what I would say salvation is in the Bible, when the hub is in its rightful place, the spokes connect to the hub. Now, here's the interesting thing about spokes. Spokes don't stop the wheel from falling outwards. That's not their job. Spokes don't push the wheel out. And the problem is, without a correct understanding of how life works, we think that by pushing things away, we will find wholeness. That's not how it works. When these spokes of what the Bible calls the fruits of the Spirit are connected to a hub, which is Christ at the center of my life, and accepting of who he is, and who God has made him to be, and who God and who the Spirit is in him, and my spirit connecting with that, what happens is the spokes connected to a hub, actually they pull the wheel inwards. That's the, what spokes do on your wheel, on your bike. They're actually applying tension that's pulling the wheel in all the time, which gives it strength to stop it failing and buckling and distorting and makes it able to carry your weight. So what we said in this whole process was that these spokes of the fruits of the Spirit, when they're in place and Christ is the hub and they work within the context of time, which is the process of our life, they pull the kingdom of God in. They're all the time pulling the kingdom of God down those spokes into the center of your life. I believe that God wants you to have a blessed life 
And a blessed life comes when, not when you're trying to push away things that are a problem, but when you start to pull in the kingdom of God, that's what changes the process of life. It will stop you buckling, and it will mean that those spokes don't distort to give you a perverted understanding of these things that all of us are looking for in life. Okay, that's a summary. Okay, here's a great little statement. A great many people think they are thinking when they are merely rearranging their prejudices. Now, the great danger when we hear all of these things and we begin to desire, I, I, want, I want this kingdom of heaven, this supernatural, this, this spirit thing, I, I want it pulled into my life. But the problem is, that for many of us, when we start to try and adjust where we are for this to happen, what we're really doing is not really thinking. We just rearrange our prejudices. The danger with any new understanding, any new revelation, any new concept that you begin to grasp is that you do not renew your mind. So you carry into what is happening what you had with you before. And you then try and mix that. Now, here's what Paul wrote. He said, and be transformed. This is Romans chapter 12. And be transformed, okay, transformation by the renewing of your mind. Which is an interesting concept because sometimes we can get so carried away with all the other stuff about emotions and experiences and what we felt that we can miss the importance of if you don't have a renewed mind, you will not have a transformed life. Now, you may have a, a touched heart, you may have something on the inside, but transformation comes by the renewing of the mind, if Paul is right, and I think he was. So, you know, I think that became, in evangelical speak, and be transformed by the removing of your mind... And we created a process by which thinking and questioning and being on a quest for truth was pushed to the side because we thought we knew everything and had anything. And if we just have a nice feeling, we must be all right with God. But Paul says transformation comes by renewing the mind. Now, renewing the mind is exactly this. Sometimes we think we're thinking when all we're actually doing is rearranging the prejudices of our lives the things that we feel strongly about, the things we don't like, the people we don't like. And we dress them up and smarten them up when actually we can still be guilty of carrying all the same prejudices through. And, and another guy, um, George MacDonald, which funnily enough was the opening statement of the chapter that's about making crooked things straight in the book that had the bookmark that has the... And, and he talks about sacred prejudices. And one of the dangers is that the prejudices of our life, we tend to make them sacred. So we, we actually start to believe that it was God who inspired us to have those prejudices, and because of that, they must be right. And that's why you have so much infighting. That's why you have, get this, 40,000 different denominations in the world, in the Christian church. 40,000 denominations, sacred prejudices is what causes that. And I think if we really get renewal of the mind, the truth is we don't just rearrange our prejudices, we get rid of our prejudices and say, do you know what, let's just come together on this, let's get the wheel right, let's get Christ at the core, and let's understand what we're really fighting for is love, joy, and peace, and all these things are where we join together and work. So I have a question for you. If someone else, remember, we're talking about moving from theory to practice. If someone else were to respond to you or toward you in any given situation in the same way you have responded towards them or it, how would you feel? How appropriate would you feel your response was? You see, because we so often think we're thinking, but just rearranging our prejudices, we tend to act in ways that we would not like anyone to act towards us. 
We, we, we all know we want grace and kindness and understanding and someone to listen and, and someone to appreciate and, and, and we want people to stay with us and be faithful. But the question is, if someone else were to respond to you or toward you in the given situation in the same way you have responded towards them or it, how would you feel? You see, far too often our primary concern is how, how do I feel? How does this make me feel? And if we have distortion in the spokes because we haven't put the hub in the center and therefore the kingdom's not being pulled in, what tends to happen is we legitimize everything that we feel to be the authentic response to a given situation and then we treat people according to how we feel which can fall into that category of we think we're thinking but actually we're merely rearranging our prejudices. How many of you know that... that, that that if we really look at the whole issue of moving from theory to practice, that Jesus based a lot of what he said on making personal decisions, not according to how it makes you feel, but how it will react with the world, how it will connect to the world, what it will do for others. And we're going to come to a very important verse in a little while. So the verse we based all this in was Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit... Love, joy, peace, patience, I like long-suffering better, but it's a long word and patience fitted better on the wheel. Long-suffering is for as long as it takes. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such, there is no law. Now, the greatest challenge in respect to the nine fruits of the Spirit is not memorizing so that you can recite them. One of the reasons I came back at this and have kept chewing at this is because I realize the danger when we meet corporately and we're in a kind of a classroom setting that, that um, we can think the challenge is to memorize them so I can recite them. Knowing what the fruits of the Spirit are doesn't do you any good. Or if it does do you some good, it's not doing you much good because all it is is information. All it is is theory. I know what they are. So, nor do I think the general idea is to select one or two that can be easily accomplished while disregarding the others. Kind of, well, I, you know, I like a bit of faithfulness and I don't mind a bit of, uh, of kindness, but I can't do any love at the moment. If you knew what happened to me, if you'd experienced what I'd been through. And so the danger is that we, we pick and choose little bits of that and then we flatter ourselves uh, of how amazingly spiritual and godly we are uh, because we picked a couple of those things out that were easy. Anybody can do what's easy. See, the issue of the fruit of the Spirit is it works in all situations at all times. It is there to change life. It's there to pull the kingdom of God in so that as you have a commitment to partner with these things and work with these things and first of all receive them from God into you, which makes you feel pretty good. Because God is full of faithfulness and goodness towards me. And what I like the most is he has a lot of long-suffering in the context of my life. But joy about me and peace toward me and love coming in. And, and then as I receive those and function in the community by letting those release through me, then the issue is that's, that's where the reality comes, not from picking one or two of them and thinking how spiritual we are. So I kind of think we're supposed to shoot for all nine as the target. And I kind of think that God, God's heart is towards us experiencing all nine so that we can live in all nine and then we can give all nine. The, the first, what I like about this fruit of the Spirit is the first to experience it is you. God wants you to feel and know these things because that's how God feels about you so that then as you release it, that's how you begin to, to act towards others in your response to them. So let me tell you what it's not. It's not love because you love me. It's not joy because you always make me happy. It's not peace because there is no conflict. 
It's not patience until I think it's taking too long. It's not kindness because I like you. It's not goodness because you do what I want. It's not faithfulness because I trust you. It's not gentleness because I think you're misunderstood. It's not self-control because I don't struggle with this. The true because of this whole business is because it pulls the kingdom of heaven into time and space. And when that is present, miracles happen. The because of the fruit of the Spirit is that reason. That's the because. Because it pulls the kingdom of heaven into time and space. And when that's present, miracles happen. How many of you ready for a miracle? That's how you pull the kingdom of heaven into time and space. Okay, but I want you to remember three important things. Fruit is not manufactured. Fruit is grown. The choice of words here are very particular to take away any thought that you might have that you can produce this love, this joy, this peace, this long-suffering, this faithfulness, this goodness. You can't produce it because fruit is not manufactured. You can't make this happen. Fruit is grown, which leads me to my second point. It doesn't grow away from the tree. How many of you know if you pluck the bud of fruit from the tree, it ain't growing anymore. You just stop the growth process because you separated it from the tree. I, I am very committed to the role of the local church in the process of the kingdom of heaven within the community of the world. I'm very committed to the fact that we would be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I'm very committed to the fact that God has planted us within something and that we become planted. The Bible talks a lot about planting. Why does it talk about that? Because fruit only grows when it's connected to the tree. I think it's important for you to be here. We don't have a lot of times that we have to be here, but I think it's important that you be here when we are here because if this is a tree on which fruit is growing and there is a connected importance so that your fruit, the fruit of your life, the fruit in you that's connected to the tree grows, it means you can't be away from the tree and expect the fruit to grow. I'm of you know it's just a simple principle. If you don't believe me, try it. Go and take some unripe fruit off a fruit tree at home and tell me how much it grows after that. So there is an importance. So here's the deal. To remember, fruit is not manufactured, it's grown. So you can't manufacture these, these, these beatitudes, these, these expressions in your life, right? They grow. They grow because you're connected to the tree. Now, of course, the tree that we're connected to is Christ, which is why Christ is at the hub and it flows from God and lots we could say about that. So the third thing is, Kate, fruit is not manufactured, it's grown. It doesn't grow away from the tree, and it is the product of a connection. So therefore, for this all to work, connection is a very important principle. Connection, first of all, to the truth. Connection to God. Connection to one another. Connection to the community in partnership. Connection is critical. These things don't work when we become disconnected. Because here's the problem, when you become disconnected, the whole thing can't progress. So connection is important. But let me also add this to those thoughts. These three we've talked about are important factors. But there are another couple of important factors that it's important for you to understand. Infestation and disconnection are the enemies of fruit production. So anybody that runs an orchard or a fruit producing grove or vineyard will tell you that the two enemies to fruit production are infestation and disconnection. You want to keep infestation away, bugs and grubs that get into the fruit because if they get in the fruit, they have a very amazing way of spreading through the whole harvest of fruit. It happens just the same with people. If you let yourself get infested with gossip and criticism and judgments 
and accusations and condemnations. It's just like the infestations in the fruit. Your fruit will not grow and it will not manifest like these fruits of love and joy and peace in the proper way if you become infested or infected by these things. Part of the reason we come together and teach and talk is to try and isolate that there are some things that will infest our lives, that will affect our lives, and that they can spread through the crop. So we have to have a kind of, what's the opposite to fertilizer? What's the thing you use for bugs? Pesticide. Oh, I like that, Danny. I like that. So we're trying to deal with pests in the church. Trying to deal. How many of you know there are still pests in the church? I'll tell you where there are other pests as well. There are pests in here. And I, I don't, I'm not saying that your head. I'm saying my, there are pests in here. Pests that want me to think things and believe things and conclude things that if I let them carry on, it's just like a grub within the fruit. It will eat its way into the core of your being and then you can't get rid of it. And then you start to rot. What do they say about one bad apple in the barrel? It makes the whole barrel bad. It's hard to say that. Whole barrel bad. The reason for that is, is, is the power of that decay is very easily transferred. So it's important that we understand then these principles in the context of the fruit of the Spirit. Infestation and disconnection of the enemies of fruit production. So if I was you and I'm not, so I make the decision for me, I am making myself aware of infestation. I don't want my thinking... I don't want my heart, my emotions to become infested by things which will destroy the fruit and I don't want to be disconnected so that I stop growing. So here's what moving from theory to practice looks like and then I'm done. It's a very complex theory. It's a very deep, um, a very deep theological truth that you need pretty much a degree in Hebrew and Greek and uh, seven years in seminary to understand. And this is it. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Most common scripture that people in the world know is, have a guess, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want Two most common hymns known to people. Amazing Grace and, uh, and God Forbid, what was the other one we sang? We sang it at Jamie's. Oh, that's another one as well. God help us. Was the, what was the one we sang? All things bright and beautiful. When, when surveyed, all things bright and beautiful and, and Amazing Grace are the two most known songs and the most common located scripture is the Lord is my shepherd. Guess what the most repeated phrase that Jesus spoke, the most known repeated phrase from the whole of the Bible that Jesus said? It's this one. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. What premise does that come from? And if you were going to have done exactly to you what you have just done to others, if you were going to have somebody behave towards you as you just behave towards them, if you were going to have somebody act in the way towards you that you just acted towards them or in the community, would you be happy with that if it was you? And you see, part of this whole issue of moving from theory to practice bases itself in practice on this principle that Jesus said, here's the deal, guys. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, here's the point. If your life is fruited with these fruits of the Spirit, 
so that your, line is, your life is experiencing not crooked, distorted lines, but straight lines of experience of love and joy and peace and gentleness and long-suffering, and you grasp those things, guess how you're going to behave towards other people? You're going to be loving. You're going to be joyful. You're going to be a peace bringer. You're going to have patience and long-suffering. You're going to show kindness. You will express goodness. You will have an unbreakable faithfulness. You will operate always with gentleness. You will experience a self-control. And against all that, there will be no law when you do unto others as you would have them do to you. Having, having heard what we've said about the fruits of the Spirit, how many of you want to be treated with those attributes? That you want those to be what flows to your life from others. And if they bring the kingdom and that flows from others, there is an initiator that is there and it's not all weep and wail and ask and beg God. The initiator is do to others what you would have them do to you. But remember what we said. You can't manufacture fruit. Fruit has to grow. How does fruit grow? When it's connected. How does it stay healthy? By staying free from infestation. What is at the core of the fruit? Christ is at the core. The spokes are there. And the kingdom of God is being pulled into your life. What's the point of all this? The point of all this is we have to come to where we focus on the point of moving from theory to practice. I'm not interested in your doctrine of the love of God if you don't love. I'm not interested in your doctrine about kindness if you're not kind. I'm not interested in your doctrine of forgiveness if you're not forgiven. I'm not interested in your doctrine of faithfulness if you're not faithful. Because it's just theory. But I believe what Jesus called us to do, if you really look at his ministry, was to pull theory into practice. Theory into practice. Lord... How many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? First staggering thing is, your brother is definitely going to sin against you. That's not a might. He is. I am to you. You are to me. He said, well, shall I give him seven shots? Jesus said, how about 70 times 7. How about an innumerable number? How about, how about you come at this with a different spirit? Because he goes on then in chapter 18 of Matthew to tell the parable of a king who was owed a great debt and the servant couldn't pay it. And the servant said to the king, I can't pay. In a million years I couldn't pay this. The debt is so great. And it said the master had mercy on him and he forgave him. And he let him go. Wonderful. But he said that person then went to a servant of his who owed him a few pennies. And demanded the servant who owed him a few pennies, pay him even though he had just been forgiven a few million by the master. And he pursued this guy until he wanted to get him in prison because of these pennies. And wanted him to pay back the pennies while he was in prison. Now, now, we're kind of finishing here in this little thought because how is the guy who owes him the pennies going to pay him back the pennies if he's put him in prison because there's no way he can now repay it. Now let me tell you what happens when we don't do to others as we'd have them do to us. We put them in prison. We imprison them because they haven't done or didn't do or didn't say or didn't care or wasn't enough. Or, and we put them in a prison, an emotional prison where we think it's just to do that because they owe this debt. They didn't. And, and the thing I hate, don't ever say this to me, you should have known better. Point is, if you knew better, you wouldn't have done it, would you? In the first place. 
And so we imprison people. And then they can't pay back the debt. So we can't forgive. They can't pay back the debt. And we finish up in a stalemate. And what happens is we become disconnected from the tree. And whatever fruit we might have had died. Now, incidentally, the master was absolutely livid at the fact that this guy did not operate out of the resource and stream of the extent of the forgiveness that he himself had experienced. See, every one of us in here has experienced an incredible, deep, wide, expansive flow of the grace, the love, the kindness of God into our lives. Who are we then to put demands on other people's lives for what, in essence, of value are penny things? Well, I didn't like you where you, you didn't talk to me, didn't look, didn't do, didn't do. You did this, you said that, you did. Penny things when actually we have experienced this wonderful flow of forgiveness and this fruit that should be in our lives. And Jesus said there is a consequence in that that is not a nice consequence because we then imprison ourselves because of our attitude. Forgive from your heart, 70 times 7. Seems to me that we can only do those things when we are connected in the fruit of the Spirit. When Christ is the hub, we've understood the kindness that has flowed to us and then it flows out and we begin to do to others what we'd have them do to us. That's the Spirit and the heart of one who is fruitful in the Spirit. It's the spirit and heart of all that I desire for this house. It's what we're aiming for. We're not looking how little trouble can we get into. We're looking for if there's trouble and we need to get into it, we want to flow into that trouble with the fruits of the spirit, with love and joy and peace and the strength of that that makes the wheel strong and the life strong and the time strong and God is with us. So I implore you as we finish this little series, move from theory to practice only do to others what you'd have them do to you, which means you have to stop and think. And if you're going to stop and think, it means you have to have a renewed mind. And if you're going to have a renewed mind, it can't be thinking by merely rearranging your prejudices. The renewed mind has to bring a transformation that says, this is amazing what God has done for us in Christ and with him at the core and these fruits flowing. We can pull the kingdom into our lives. We can pull the kingdom into our community. We can pull the kingdom into our city. It's, it's an unstoppable force because against such, there is no law. I invite you into it. More so, God invites you into it to come in and be fruitful as you connect it to him. Just bow your heads. We're just going to pray. Father, thank you that you have opened the kingdom of heaven to us in an amazing way that it will not come in limited or restricted measure but it comes with fullness. Just like you told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth like it is in heaven. I pray for every life as we've shared these thoughts and gone through this process that we will move all of us from theory to practice and that we will only do to others as we would have them do to, you, to us, but we do that from the core of Christ at the center of the wheel of the fruits of the Spirit in the context of our life and the movement that that creates because that brings your kingdom into our world. And so before we go tonight, Father, I pray for miracle power. I pray for healing power. I pray for forgiving power. I pray for peace and life and help and comfort and strength in this house, in every life we pray. And may our connections cause us to see that life of the Spirit flowing through us, that fruit being given to the world, as well as we enjoy it. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thanks, guys. We're going to receive the pay it forward and, uh, and then we're done. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.